Are you still getting some equal? No, it's all over. Okay, I think finally. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think we had a nice equoing start. So, anyway, uh, so let's get started with the session with Dhuma. And uh, if you're good, can we get started? Yep. Okay, perfect. So, first things first, Dhuma, would you, would you want to kind of share your, uh, your video as well? Yeah, sure. Okay. So, I'll also just enable my video. It's just that I'm facing a little lag on my system. Okay, meanwhile, friends, can you all give me a quick yes if all of you can hear us clearly? So if you're able to hear me and the Dima clearly, just let me know. Okay, it was perfect. So I see voice is not an issue. Okay. So Ridhima, uh, what we'll do today is uh, we'll kind of first walk, walk through your profile, okay, and um, we'll kind of introduce you to the audience. After that, we would want to kind of discuss on further aspects of your profile, which are like really interesting, and probably I would kill to have such a profile. So give me a moment. I'll just share the, uh, I'll share my deck, and then we'll get started. So sorry, guys. I think there's some internet issues at my end. I'm just trying my best to get it sorted out. Okay, I think I should be able to share my screen now. Okay, so Ridhima, before you share your screen, I have a small intro deck for you. And um, friends, can can I just have a quick yes if all of you are able to see the deck and you're able to see, uh, I mean, if you, if you can hear me clearly and you're able to see Ridhima as well. Okay, yeah, that would be me. Yeah, so hi, Ridhima. So let's get started for today's discussion and welcome all of you. Uh, today's discussion is going to be kind of a very interesting idea about how uh, Ridhima kind of uh, built her career and how is this related to data and what does she do as a product manager and how does all of these things weave together? How does the world run on data is something that she knows best because if you see the kind of uh, company she's worked for, that's really impressive. So a little bit of background about Ridhima. So Ridhima is a product manager. Uh, she's, she's, uh, she's currently working at Facebook. Uh, she did a BA in Delhi and then post that she moved on to work for Google for a while. And then she also kind of did her MBA from Indian School of Business. And she, she's currently head of driving teams in the product management sector. And along with that, few of her core skills would be that of products that of data-driven decision-making, because if you want to run good products, if you want to run people, you should be really good at making data-driven decisions and handling people. That's one more beautiful skill that somebody would really want to have, kind of have. But what is more interesting here is, what I really want to kind of show all of you is this link at the bottom, which is her LinkedIn profile. Now, if you walk into a LinkedIn profile, this is what you observe. You name the world's best companies and you'll find it here. So Facebook, Google, Flipkart, uh, oath and uh, I mean this is terrific profile with them I mean I would love to hear how did you get kind of build uh, your profile into this space I mean if, if I were not into insane probably I would have killed to kind of get into these companies so so currently you are working in San Francisco Bay Area so Ritima, without any further delays uh, let me ask you the very first question which is how do you manage to do this <laughs> I mean, this is pretty interesting yeah Thank you so much. I think that's very kind of you to say that it's a great profile. I think I, it's it's a combination of luck, hard work, and being strategic about what are the, the career choices that you make over a period of time. Right. Um, for me, when I was doing my graduation in Delhi University, I realized that I needed to be I needed to be in a company that I will love. Uh, build work on products that I use and I know understand how people use on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, that was actually one of the biggest motivation for me to join Google right after college. I did have the option of doing an MBA from IIM Ahmedabad. 
I had an offer from I am Bangalore. I had done what everyone else does in India. We, I took the CAT and I was pretty sure that I should be doing an MBA from one of the IAMs. But somewhere inside, I knew that if I wanted to do, if I wanted to be successful in the real world, it's not the education that will help me, but being able to apply that education in real world, which is why I decided to instead uh, work before I did an MBA. I thought it will just be so much more powerful to be able to understand the real world, how corporate companies work, how teams operate, how people work, what are the expectations that are set for employees at different levels, um, how does calibration work, how do people enjoy their work every single day, what are the tenets of a good job that you wake up to and are excited to do every day. I wanted to make sure that I understand this before I get into an MBA and have a higher escalation of commitment uh, to be working in the corporate world, which is awesome. why I ended up, to working, ended up working at Google. And um, I did that for five years before I did an MBA at ISB. Wonderful, wonderful. So I think, yeah, quite a, quite a few bits and pieces that we got to kind of learn from you around uh, how do you kind of strategize your career. And the word strategy in itself resonates a lot with a product manager. Uh, can you help us understand what exactly does a day of a product manager look like? Like, what do you do as a product manager? Because a lot of friends here who are attending a session right now, uh, they come from different varied backgrounds. So there's very few we'll have from product management. So if you can just give them a glimpse of what is your day-to-day -day life like. Yeah, absolutely. So um, based on working in the product management world for now over 11, 12 years now, I think you can literally distribute the product management life into three areas, right? The first is that we make sure that we are able to connect and communicate. When I say connect and communicate, the job is to be able to focus on building team cohesion and chemistry, building one-on-one -on -one relationships with each person on the team, helping everyone understand what their roles are in the larger picture, being able to connect the dots and keeping your cross-functional team connected even as it is growing. So as a product manager, you are not only responsible for the product that you're building, but every single cross-functional team that is contributing to the success of the product. When I say contributing to uh, cross-functional teams, what I mean is your financial counterparts, your financial teams, your product marketing teams, your design teams, your eng teams, your product experience analysts, your researchers, your uh, data scientists, data engineers, each and every person is a block in the larger picture and is contributing to the success of the overall product. And as that product manager, you need to keep your cross-functional teams connected even as it is growing and focus on building that deep cohesion and chemistry. That's one. The second is, um, analyzing and documenting uh, and discovering as well. So the idea is how do you, the best way to accomplish this is to be able to talk to the customer. A product manager is literally the, the, the voice of the customer on the table. So if say we are all in a meeting room and there are 10 people in the meeting room from product management, design, data eng, data science, uh, product experience, product, you basically have to think that the product manager is actually the customer, the voice of the customer on that table when you're making a decision, which means that you need to be in constant touch with how your customers are reacting and responding to your product. You need to do constant comparative analysis to see how are competitors meeting the needs of the customers. You need to be doing market research constantly, both primary and secondary research to understand what are some of the untapped opportunities that no one is looking at. A ton of times customers may not be able to tell you what they want because they themselves don't know, but they'll be able to tell you what their problems are so that you can figure out what the best solution is. Um, I like to quote, uh, Ford here, if you guys know, Henry Ford, when, um, when they were building cars back in the day, they went and asked people, hey, what do you want to, to be able to commute from one place to other? And everyone answered, we want faster horses. Um, it was Henry Ford's vision who said, they don't want faster horses. They want to reach from one place to the other faster, which is why cars were developed. Right. So as a product manager, really, that is your job to be able to discover that untapped opportunity, analyze it, and then be able to come up with the solution there. 
So once you do that, then being able to communicating and connecting your team to be able to get to that success is super important. Very nice. So uh, a lot of you may be wondering so far that, uh, okay, we were here to learn data science and then we have a product manager here. So if you just, if you just listen to what Rudhima said in the last answer, and if you closely follow it, she actually highlighted all the pointers that are very, I mean, that is highly overlapping with the data science field as well. So understanding your customer, okay, this is, this goes without a say, it doesn't matter which field you are in, you need to understand your customers well. Understanding and collecting the right data to make sure that your decisions are proper. That's again, something that a product manager does every day. In fact, to some extent in the industry today, data scientist and product management, these two fields may look different but there's a massive overlap between these two feeds. So Ritima, can you just highlight quickly for our friends here? Because primarily we, we, are a, we are an institute where we focus majorly on data science, but you are the person who's using it in industry every day. So can you give a quick glimpse of how data science overlaps with your job role? Yeah, absolutely. So data scientists and product managers actually work very, very closely together. As a product manager, my job, once I build a product and I launch it, is to make sure that I see it through that I'm able to analyze that product performance, that I'm able to understand how people are using that product. And I'm able to evolve that product into something that will be one of the uh, you know, world-class products, which means that I have to look at user-oriented metrics. I need to look at business-oriented metrics. I need to look at company metrics. I need to look at top-line metrics and make sure that they all ladder up so that overall the company and the business can grow while our customer base grows. So being able to define those metrics is extremely important. And I'll talk a lot more about how you define good metrics. But okay. if you think of some user-oriented metrics, things like active users, session yeah. duration, actions per session, adoption rates, customer retention, churn, like all of these metrics seem really easy to understand. But when and where to come up with the right metric, how to define it, how to operationalize it, how to use systems to be able to scale these metrics across the company, how to communicate these metrics is something that the data science and product managers work very closely together to come up with the right methodologies. I think the second aspect is also how we run experiments, right? So as a product manager, my job, you know, I work at really large companies. I worked at Google and Flipkart and Facebook, where we are really building products for now at Facebook, billions of users. Right. And so we can't just do a market research with say tens of thousands of people and make a decision for billions of users. And okay. so we do A-B testing and how the A-B testing framework is set up. I'll talk a lot more about it in detail, but these are areas where we collaborate very closely with data science to define the metric, design the experiment, create a framework on the experimentation, uh, analyze the experiments, run A-B tests, um, figure out exposures, and then finally make ship or no ship decisions. Yeah, the moment you picked up these terms, it, it kind of excited me a lot because I, I, I kind of relate these into data science every day. And uh, what a product manager does is no different from what a data scientist would actually kind of help the project product manager achieve. So do you work with product managers in your, yeah, sorry, do you work with uh, data scientists in your team as well with them? We work very closely with data scientists. Very closely, right? Yeah. So, so there's like a huge kind of requirement for you to kind of uh, work with data scientists on a regular basis, especially because you're working for a big company like Facebook, which is kind of catering to a few billions of people across the globe. So yep. I think without any further delay, I, you have a lot of useful stuff for us, I'm pretty sure. And I don't want to waste any further time. I'll stop blabbering now. I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Ritima. And we are looking forward to hear a lot of things from you. I may have a few questions here and there. Uh, if you're okay, I can probably ask you during the slides itself. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So you, you can feel free to share the screen. So friends, I'll hand it over to Radhima. She's going to share a deck and she's going to walk us through the different approaches that a product manager follows. What is more essential for all of you to kind of do is listen to her very closely and understand how, how is this being used at a very larger level, okay? at a very broader level, how, how, how decision makers really kind of make the decisions. What is the behind the scenes uh, for these companies? Please make sure that all of you are making uh, proper notes for what Radhima has to share so that we can kind of ensure that we are kind of educated enough from her knowledge that she's sharing today. So Pritva, would you want me to share the deck or are you, are you planning to share? Uh, you can share and I can, I can just talk through it. Perfect. So give me a moment. I'll just open the deck.
So just let me know once you're able to see the deck. I'm sharing my screen in a bit. Yeah, it should be up in some time. Yep. It's up? Okay, yeah, perfect. So yes, Raduma, over to you. I'll just mute myself. And in case I have some questions, I'll just come in between. Yeah, sounds great. Do you yeah, want to go to the next slide? Sure. So just let me know when I need to switch. Yep. So like I was mentioning right now, right? Product managers are really accountable for the success of the product. And they're also responsible for the growth of the team. Data scientists are really just one part of the entire ecosystem to say, uh, which are responsible for building a really great product, right? For you, for when as a user, when you're using the product, it might just be a blue button here or there. But the amount of research, the amount of effort that goes into building that blue button is manifold, right? The content designer figures out, hey, what is the content that, that will be usable, which can actually be translated in 190 countries in 200 languages. So what is that right content that we can use? What should that placement be if we're looking at 35 different screen sizes on mobile and we're looking at web and if it is not interactive? What is the size of the button based on screen sizes and literacy of the user who's going to be using the product, right? Um, the engineer is building it, making sure that it is scalable across platforms and across surfaces. The data science is saying how many people are clicking on it, bouncing it, bouncing off, stuff like that. The data engineers are building pipelines so we can build dashboards, which can eventually be used to scale the data for all the leadership and everyone else in the team to see. The product marketing is going out there and saying, hey, do you really need this feature? Should this be a primary feature or a secondary feature? And based on which, how should the button be placed? Um, so as you can understand, this is really just a button. I build like ground up one to 10, like zero to one products, which are not just buttons, but like real overall products. And you can imagine the amount of work that goes into that. And really so the life of the product manager in a day will go from talking to users, grooming the backlog, doing market research, meeting your cross-functional partners, brainstorming ideas on untapped opportunities, reviewing your key performance indicators to see where your product is doing well, where it's not doing well, building roadmaps for the next quarter, for the next half, for the next year, for the next five years, and building your team in a way that everyone is moving really fast and in the same direction. One of the biggest um, mistakes that product managers make is like, oh, I am the one with the best idea. I understand data really well. I'm able to communicate really well, but every single cross-functional person in the team is running in a different direction. And that's, that is the perfect recipe for a failed product. And so um, as a product manager, you are really responsible for doing all of these things, which is why a day or a week in a product manager's life looks very different based on the kind of product you're building uh, and the life stage at which the product is. And like I just earlier said, all activities can eventually be classified into these three things. How are you connecting and communicating with the team? How are you figuring out the product ideas, talking to your customers, doing research? How are you documenting all of this and making decisions and thereby also communicating it with your leadership and stakeholders so that everyone's on the same page? Let's move on. Sure. Now, as I said, right, like I think I've given you a good idea of what a product manager's life is all about. Now let's delve a little bit deeper into what is the power of metrics to make a product super successful. So like I was mentioning, to build products, product intuition is valuable, but it must be used in conjunction with data. This is an age old question that we've all been asking ourselves and I've been asking myself in every phase of product development. Do I wanna be data informed or do I wanna be data driven? And the answer is it depends, right? You wanna be data driven in cases where a product is super mature and you understand the market really well. And it's something that has been done and dusted by multiple competitors. And so you understand the market really well. But you want to be data informed in cases where the product is fairly new and it's a new industry or a new problem that you're tackling because that's where product intuition becomes extremely important, right? When you use data in conjunction with your product intuition, 
it helps you earn the support and enthusiasm of all the executive colleagues, which eventually end up getting you a lot of resources uh, to build your product and go out there and think out of the box and build something completely new, right? It also helps keep all your cross-functional teams focused on solutions that matter to your customers, to your market, right? You are able to build more successful products and grow your company's bottom line. Uh, it helps you spend your limited resources more effectively if you're using data. And it will also help you better predict what will resonate with your customers. All of this while is very, it should come as a product intuition, but if not used with data, you will end up using your limited resources very ineffectively, testing things that may not work or just not uh, solve the real problem that exists in the market. And so the right metrics can give, you, can give you and all the stakeholders across the company, which means your marketing, sales, support, finance, management, and very accurate picture of how the product is performing and what are the next steps and why you decided to go with the next step. Next slide. Yeah, so Ritima, I have a small question here. Now, mm -hmm. this slide in itself is pretty interesting because uh, there are two parts to it. Uh, let's consider Facebook's... Um, Mm, the the wall feature now that that's like been existing since since the very beginning and it's a very established product right now uh, along with that uh, when you're putting up some post what are the i mean if i go granular then probably uh, the like button okay now that in itself could be one feature for a product manager to kind of take care and what are the variations that we can have in the like button now yeah. if it's an established product what i understand is the data is easily available because we have been capturing it for a lot of time now, uh, when you talked about, say, something like a new feature or a new market or a new strategy that you're implementing, you, should, you want to be data aware. Now, the problem is, where do you get that data from? Yeah. Um, for a new product, you need to just figure out logging, right? Um, for a product that is still not launched. So there are three aspects of it, right? There is a product that you want to launch, still not launched, and you don't know how it's going to do. What sort of data should you use then? There's yeah. a product that just launched, so and it's completely new. So what should your success metrics look like? And then there's a fairly established product. So you just need to grow it and evolve it with the changing times. Um, what sort of data should you look, look at for those? Let's start with the first version. When you don't have, when you haven't really launched a product, the best way to gauge whether it'll do well or not is through prototyping. So right, we actually okay. build prototypes and we take it out there in the market and mm -hmm. we do research at scale where we tell people to use it. We use right. things like eye, uh, eyeball tracking and we use mm -hmm. things like where are people clicking? What are mm -hmm. the questions people asking? How are people engaging with the product? And we use all of that information to gauge exactly how we should be able to launch this product and what are some of the changes we should make before we launch it. So a lot Wonderful. of focus then goes on prototyping. For a product that is just launched and it's something completely new out of the box, not done in the past, all of the things that today Facebook is doing in the, in the privacy world, in the security world, is really like cutting edge technology that they're building from the ground up where really no competitor has done it in the past, right? Okay. Being able to fight elections, being able to fight fake news, being able to fight low quality e-commerce is really something that um, Facebook is doing from the ground up. And in those cases, at different mm -hmm. stages in the life cycle of the product, you decide metrics. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Wonderful. I think yeah, this, 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 this is a pretty vital point because uh, most of us are very used to kind of having data served to us on a golden plate. However, uh, being in Facebook, it's going to be all the more exponentially difficult for you because every day you're launching something new and the experience that the number of experiments that you're running, that's massive. I mean, uh, I, mean I, I feel afraid when I talk about it. I, I would wonder what kind of volumes of data you guys are handling every day, right? So yeah, I think that is pretty interesting. So I look forward for the next uh, next discussion on the metrics again. So how do you define a good success metric? So let's let's get into it and over to you, Ritima. Yep. So there are really three tiers of metrics that you can think of. Tier one metrics are, let's actually start with tier three metrics. Tier three metrics are the vanity metrics. They can really boost the product team's morale. 
you will want to be cautious about putting too much weight on them because these metrics are really like the feel good metrics things like how much traffic did i get on my website right and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the drawbacks of tier 3 metrics then there are tier 2 metrics that go a little bit deep, deeper these are like proxy metrics or directional metrics that suggest something about the potential success of the product um but they themselves do not represent or give any evidence of how the product is performing in the market and how users are responding to it and so these can be used and should be used in multiple cases but they have it, they have their own drawbacks and then there is a tier 1 metric which are the essential business and customer oriented metrics and they are the ones you'll want to focus on primarily they are also sometimes called kpis and they capture concrete data about like top line metrics like revenue customer retention acquisition user base etc and really these are the metrics that are important if you're a public company these are the metrics that are important which will define the valuation of your company which will define the success of your company which will define what is it that vision of the company over the period of years right if you see that the size of user base isn't growing you'll notice that the stock market is tanking for that company so those are the tier 1 metrics um and really as a product manager everything that you do while you look at tier 3 and tier 2 metrics maybe for that feature and for that product you need to make sure that each of them ladders up to either one or more of the tier 1 metrics so everything that you do is somehow um uh, moving that tier 1 metric and thereby imp- uh, making an impact on the top line for the company let's so, move on yes yeah, so so if i understand correctly uh, can we say that tier 3 and tier 2 metrics it's it's not that you don't collect them you do collect them however and your end goal is to reach to tier 1 metrics and knowing which is which is supposed to be in tier 1 is one of the major tasks of that of a product manager and can we have, have a similar analogy for data scientists as well like uh, how to prioritize your metrics is very important as a data scientist as well yes yep. so actually it is really the data scientist prerogative to make sure that the pm is looking at the right metrics tier 3 metrics tier 2 metrics and tier 1 metrics i have seen a ton of times that a pm is very happy with tier 3 metrics because they are easy to move they're super sensitive um but really are not really impacting the top line or the business and uh, it is really the data science uh, data science prerogative to say hold on this is good you're moving this but how is it laddering up to moving retention or how is it moving re- revenue and if it is not then how can we evolve the metrics to start looking at those numbers how do we make sure that how do we know what is the value of one person visiting the website to revenue being able right. to draw those correlations is really the prerogative of the data scientist still awesome so so yeah in in some sense this is how close the data scientists actually work with product manager they give them a direction as to what is going right and what is going wrong So yep. Ritma before you move on to the next slide can you get your examples of tier 3 and tier 2 metrics we have it on the next slide let's okay, move on perfect to the next perfect, perfect okay so yeah oh wow so we are going to build something yep so yeah. now we just spoke about some tier 3 2 and 1 and what those definitions are now let's build success metrics for this company called must see india it's an indian startup in the travel space right a little bit about the company i would actually encourage you all to google the company must see india and just take a look at the home page and so that if it's possible uh, for you to also do that we'll just quickly take a look at it as well if you just google must see india it will give a, all the people listening to it a good idea of what we're talking about so this is the website this is a company that's doing really well it's a startup in india um it's in the travel space as you can notice you have a ton of things going on here you can create a personalized holiday package in 10 minutes you can figure out top places destinations interest you can book flights hotels trains and buses and if you scroll down even further you will notice if you just scroll down further you will notice that they also have tools to plan your travel like a distance calculator driving directions visual planner and what not so lots of things this company is offering and you can imagine that for each i mean just for simplicity sake 
let's assume that each of these tools, each of the modules on top that we saw has one PM each, right? Let's assume there's someone responsible for people clicking on top places, someone responsible for booking weekend getaways, someone responsible for booking it from the module on the left, on the right, around flights, hotels, someone responsible for the banner on the top and people clicking onto that, right? So let's just assume that there are like five to six PMs working on this entire homepage. Cool, let's go back. So we're building a success, we are building success metrics for must see India. It's an Indian startup. It provides online customized holiday packages. Users can, can create their own package without the need for call center contact. It provides access to in-depth travel guides. It helps you calculate the distance between cities and travel destinations to make planning easier. It provides a visual planner, driving directions. It helps you book hotels, flights, buses, and trains. Let's move on. Let's see some of the vanity metrics or tier three metrics for must see India, right? Some of the example metrics for tier three will be website traffic, which will tell us the number of people who are landing on the website, average session time, which will tell us on average, how much time are people spending per session? And then we can look at the number of clicks that they're making. So we can say how many people clicked on weekend getaways, how many people actually made a search, how many people clicked on driving directions, or we can also say number of pages viewed per session, right? So these are some example tier three metrics. I'd love for you guys to kickstart a discussion in the chat and tell me maybe a few more vanity metrics that you can think of for must see India. And then let's think if all of these metrics, do they tell you anything about how your product is resonating with customers or how well it will do in the coming months? I see people saying bounce rate, downloads, bookings. Um, downloads, yes. Bookings, no. Churn, no. So these are not funnel conversion rate, average video completion. These are not um, vanity metrics. Average completion rate is. But if you think of vanity metrics, tier three metrics are really just metrics on the surface, right? Uh, and so you will look at things like like you're saying, chatbot interactions. Yes, that is definitely one. Um, um, visits, yes. Cookies, yes. Locations from where people are coming, yes. So you guys got it, right? Average time spent on the website, yes. Number of comments, exactly. So you guys got it. Now, these are your vanity metrics. But really, if you think about it, are they really telling you how the, how the product is going to do in the next coming months? or how well the customers are doing, it won't. The reason being that you might see, oh, I have so many interactions with the chatbot, but they could all be because people are just frustrated with the product and they're asking you for questions, which ideally they should be able to do on the website. You might see a ton of traffic on your website, but they could all be coming to your website to just uh, maybe look at driving directions, right? Uh, average session time much, is much longer, but do you know if, it, if a long session time or a short session time is good? We don't know. So this is useful for driving the morale up. It tells you some adoption metrics. It tells you, um, you know, how people, like how are people responding to your product? It can give you some sort of analysis on saying, okay, you know, I have so much traffic, but if 10% is the bounce rate, then industry bounce rate is, should be lower. So maybe we can improve that. But it really doesn't tell you what will be this company's outlook two years from now, five years from now, one year from now, right? So let's move on. So vanity metrics do give you initial signal, but they have their own disadvantages. It's very easy if, if a product manager only looks at these metrics, it's easy to mislead product direction. An example being that I see a ton of traffic on my website, as a product manager, I and I say I am gold on getting more traffic. Say that's my um, that's my metric. What I will end up doing is trying to get as much traffic as possible on the website, irrespective of whether it's whether it's having a good conversion rate, whether it's relevant, whether it's actually going to move the top line metric. 
So it's easy to game these metrics, but they're vanity metrics. So it feels good. Oh, I have 2 million, adver- 2 million businesses coming onto my website. Or in, th- in cases of Masi India, I have 20 million users coming on my website daily, right? Well, sure, but how much business are you generating? And so the question to ask is, do these result in real business outcomes or impact on top line company metrics? It may lead to inefficient product investments because now if I am gold on website traffic, I will put all my efforts, I will put all my end efforts and product marketing efforts and money and finance in getting more traffic to the website, which really may not move the business outcomes, right? And they generally, you will notice, don't really move the needle on core business metrics until used in conjunction. Let's move on to tier two metrics. Now, tier two metrics are essentially your directional metrics or must uh, or uh, proxy metrics. So for must see India, some of the example directional metrics would be things like weighted engagement, which will tell us quality of engagement, which means does this engagement have a potential to convert to business? Which means that if people are engaging with a weekend planner, and and engaging with driving directions and also doing a search, I give a weight to each of these actions. I come up with a formula to come up with weighted engagement. And now that might tell me what is the probability of success and conversion to real business, right? So it again, it's not really moving my metric directly, which is the core business metric, but it gives you good direction and it's a good proxy metrics, right? Weighted feature adoption. Um, social sharing, customer reviews. Like I have so many people sharing this product with their customers and so there might be some use. Uh, I have so many customer reviews um, and so people are actually liking the product and it tells you that, all right, if I have so many people responding to my product, so many people writing reviews, so many people doing social sharing, then it does tell me to some shape or form how the company might do in the coming months, right? I'd love for you guys to think of some tier two metrics now and put them in the chat. And I can see NPS score, that's right. Uh, Average revenue per session, that's right. Cart conversion, that's right. Uh, Newsletter subscribers, that's right. Um, Yep, so you guys got it. Um, So these are all your tier two metrics. Uh, Let's move on to some of the drawbacks of tier two metrics. So they are better than vanity metrics, but they should always be used in conjunction with not star metrics. So they give you a good understanding of areas the team should invest in. Uh, uh, They again may not result in real business outcomes or impact on top line company metrics, but they give you good direction. They may lead to inefficient product investments if over-indexed upon. So for example, if I am over-indexing on cart abandonments, right? Um, Say I say, oh, you know what? 20% of people are abandoning the cart. And so I want to make sure that they don't. You know what I can do? I can give free products and add them to the cart and have people check out with a zero zero dollar, zero rupees value. And then my cart abandonment issue is solved, right? but it has led to an inefficient product investment because I don't want to solve cart abandonment. What I truly want to solve is people buying products. And so I should use this as a directional metric to say, in this context, for my cart abandonment ratio to go down, I need to make sure that people buy more often, right? And so that's how I should use North Star metric with this directional metric to have people use it correctly. And it can move the needle on core business metrics if used smartly. Let's go to tier one metrics now, which are the business and customer metrics for must see India. And so some of the example metrics are revenue, which is which tells you, you know, the impact on top line revenue, customer acquisition cost, which is uh, are your marketing expenses too high or are you profitable? Uh, Do you need to charge more for your products? Do you need to reduce your marketing expenses? What is the customer acquisition cost? The unique number of paying customers, which is business growth, adoption, future outlook, things like that, right? 
So unique number of paying customers will tell us what is the adoption, what is the future outlook, is it growing, is it growing year on year, month on month, and if it is, then you know that the product is doing well, it's evolving, it's meeting the needs of the customers, and so more and more people are buying it or using it. Let's move on. And tier one metrics give us the most accurate read on the business performance and uh, customer sentiment. So they help in understanding the health of the business, the growth over years, the investment areas that we should be looking at. Uh, they are generally not very sensitive and so they're difficult to move and they require coordinated efforts across all of XFN which means that the data scientist needs to measure them correctly, create the right pipelines, make sure that leadership is looking at the right data, defining the right metrics, making sure that we have this, the right primary and secondary metrics that we are going on, have the right North Star metric that we are going on. Product marketing needs to talk to the customers and ask the right questions. Product managers need to define the right solutions. Designers need to design for the customer and meet the customer where they are. And so each and every XFN really needs to work together in order to move one of these North Star metrics, right? And it really keeps the team true to the value and helps evolve the vision and mission of the organization. Uh, and so data scientists really becomes extremely important in making sure that the company, the product, the team is moving in the right direction, has the right vision, has the right mission, has the right tenets, has the right strategy. So, Rudhima, uh, the example that we use here is pretty, uh, pretty sleek. And what I really liked about this idea is when, when we are trying to build this website, uh, as a team, I would have created these three tiers of metrics. However, what, one thing that kind of uh, strikes me is this would also apply to individual level metric, right? I mean, individual level product manager. So, if you are building just the search feature, uh, you would actually have to build your own three tiers of metrics, right? Or is it just that the group as a whole has to decide that? No, metrics are at each level. So, so at building the search feature? Yeah. So when you're building the search feature, you would either way have to build your own three three tires of metrics, right? Yes. Perfect, perfect. Okay. So I'll over to you. Yep. So just to summarize, uh, tier one metrics or vanity metrics, they tell you how well your business is connecting with the general public. Tier two or directional metrics will give you data points that suggest how well your product might succeed when launched, if you haven't launched it yet. Or uh, uh, it also gives you like some directional indicators of success, but they're not scientific indicators of product success. And tier three, which are business and customer metrics, tell you the most accurate picture of how the business is performing and how customers are responding and evolving with the product. Now, we spoke about so many metrics, uh, but really when it comes down to practice, it's extremely important for each team at each level. Like I'm a product manager, I manage a team of 10 PMs, for example. Each of the 10 PMs that I manage will have a North Star metric that they are operating at. That North Star metric will then ladder up at my level, which will become the org level North Star metric. And then multiple, like my peers who also have like say five, 10 people reporting to them, our North Star metrics will ladder up to then become the business unit level North Star metric, which will eventually then keep laddering up to become Facebook level North Star metric, right? On average, as you keep growing up all, over and over and your scope increases and your responsibility and accountability and just the, the level at which you are able to make an impact changes, the number of North Star metrics go up. But in general, a good rule of thumb is that for people at our levels, we should have at least one or two North Star metrics that we are looking at, right? And really these North Star metrics will change over time, right? Uh, for a new product, it is different. For a midlife product, it is different. For subscription businesses, it is different. For hardware products, it is different. So really the data scientist really needs to think hard to say, what is the North Star metric for this team, given the impact and the scope that they have, given the charter that this team has? What is that, what is that one or two North Star metrics that we should be gold upon that this team is truly accountable and responsible for, right? Um, so just to give you guys some examples, um, a new product or company, 
uh, the North Star metric in that point in time should be something like an adoption or number of active users, right? For a midlife product, been there for two, three years, there is a ton of competition, market share becomes important, lifetime value becomes important, revenue becomes important, right? Uh, for a pivotal product, never done before, thought leadership, out of the box completely, NPS are some of, uh, or engagement becomes a North Star metric. NPS is net promoter score, which will eventually tell you how people are engaging with your product. What's the interest like in your product? How are people responding to it? What percent, what type of people are responding to it? What are their questions? How are they thinking of using it, right? For subscription businesses, it's generally monthly active. They look at monthly because generally subscriptions are monthly. They look at churn, right? So really depending on the life stage of the product, the type of product, the scope of the product, the area of control, the DS has to really think about, hey, what are the North Star metrics? What should it be defined at and how should I operationalize it? Uh, the the um, a metric, a North Star metric that the team takes on has three tenets. It should be easy to understand, it should be easy to operationalize, and it should be sensitive and easy to be moved. And if it does all of these three things, then that's a strong North Star metric. I'm getting oh. a few questions. Why is yeah, it I, called? Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think, yeah. So the questions that, that are uh, primarily being asked is what is NPS and why do they call it North Star? So North Star basically is the most important metric for your company. So Ritma, if I understand correctly, uh, so the metrics can actually change the hierarchy, right? So something that is L1, sorry, which is tier one for me as a new new company could possibly be a tier two for a mid-sized company. Absolutely. Right? So the metrics, will it's, it's very contextual in nature. And mm -hmm. as data scientists, we deal with context every day. And uh, we got to be aware of which metric hits my business the most. And I should be kind of focusing hard on that and making that as my North Star metric. Now, followed by that, you should also build your tier two and tier three metrics so that you can utilize this knowledge of the overall behavior of your business. And these metrics are going to kind of help you solve that problem. So yeah. I'll just pick up one question here. Um, so we have, when you acquire any product, how do you make sure it's Facebook product standard and metrics? Developing new wheel is not the good idea. So how to maintain the same product quality as Facebook has for existing products? It's a little complicated question, but uh, yeah, if you can just uh, answer this. I mean, if I understand correctly, what uh, Jigna implies is how do you maintain that consistency across different metrics for, for new features or new products that you're going to kind of build? Yeah, I can and see I, that Jigna has asked this. When you acquire any product, how do you make sure it's as for Facebook product standard and metrics? So when you acquire a product, you're not really looking at Facebook product standard or metrics. When you're acquiring a product, you're looking at does it match the vision and mission of the company? So for example, Facebook's mission is to connect the world, right? To make meaningful connections in the world, right? And so Instagram, when Facebook acquired Instagram, really what Instagram was doing was being able to connect people through visual uh, stuff, through photographs, right? Um, they had all of these filters and people were interacting, people were building connections, people were making friends, people were following, learning, stuff like that. And it really matched the vision of the product or Facebook. It matched the mission for Facebook. And so it was a good fit. So if you think of that, if you think about it, all of the acquisitions that Facebook has made has not been around, oh, what is the color schemes that you use? What are the metrics that you measure? What is really, um, you know, uh, what is it? Like, what is the product standard that you have? It doesn't really matter because once you acquire the product, you decide how, how, how that product is going to evolve over a period of time, as long as you stay true to the mission of that company. Same thing with WhatsApp. When Facebook acquired WhatsApp, WhatsApp was in a way enabling meaningful connections, one-to-one -one connections, group connections between people because people were now able to chat and talk to each other very easily, especially given that WhatsApp was such a large product in all of the emerging markets, right? And so it was a really strong acquisition for Facebook because they acquired the product because they realized that they can advance their mission of connecting the world now by connecting people through another channel of messaging in global markets where Facebook didn't have that sort of a blueprint. 
So, so I think uh, this reminds me of a very popular jargon that MBA grads use. Uh, it's called a synergy. So, it's, yeah. it's always a top-down game. So, uh, if, if the synergy is mass, uh, getting a framework and standardizing your process across the two organizations, it's not a big deal. It's being done across the world every day. So, yeah. So, we'll, we'll move to the next part, which is how should you kind of uh, build that pro- product roadmap on B. Yep. Actually, let me answer this question by Santosh before I move on. I think that's a very important question. It yeah. says, okay. how much of the acquisition decision is driven by data? And the answer to that, that is, in my mind, it is, um, it is equally important to the synergies of the mission, right? Uh, and two types of data, really. One is data around what's the usage right like now, right? How many people are using? how many people are engaging with it, what's the revenue, what's the market share, because you want to make sure that when you acquire a company, you pay a fair price for that company, right? Um, it has to do well with the, with the founders, the employees, the customers of that company. And so you pay a fair price for that company. So that is the data you look at. But the other data you look at is the future outlook. If, if, a, if a Facebook was to overtake a company today, how can Facebook enable that company to grow manifold at a much more exponential pace than what it would have grown without Facebook, right? So really, there are two, it's a two-pronged approach. You look at the current state, and then you look at the future outlook, and you make a, make a valuation of it together when you pay the fair price for that company. So data is actually as important as the fact that, you know, what is the mission and does it match the mission of the company? Okay, we can move on now. So, um, so then I think the next question that comes up is how should the product roadmap be based on data? Because we've spoken about how important it is to measure success, but really how should it be based on data? And we must tie the product roadmap to the product success metrics, right? So like I was saying, use success metrics to provide strategic reasoning for each roadmap initiative. So I switch it, I switch it simply, right? Like if I'm building that search feature or if I'm building on the newsfeed, I'm building that like button, make sure that you're using the success metrics for each of these initiatives, right? You can include one or more success metrics under each theme uh, in the product roadmap. And this can give your stakeholders an and at a glass understanding of why you've chosen to prioritize a theme and a product and an initiative, what it will help you accomplish and how it ladders up to that North Star metric, right? And then use the roadmap itself to help you establish the right success metric. So it will include, like I was saying, right? Like the right uh, web-based roadmap will include a weighted scoring feature. It will help your product team compare and analyze competing initiatives based Area like revenue, market share, churn, whatever your metric is, and therefore help you prioritize the right metric. So you use your, met- you make sure that you, when you're looking at all of the projects, what is the estimated impact size? This, therefore, you can prioritize. And then for each of the things that prioritize, what is the measure or what is the success metric that it will move and therefore move the North Star metric? And so data becomes extremely important. And we work very closely with our uh, data scientists to actually do this entire roadmap planning. Awesome. So I think yeah, data scientists, uh, they kind of play a massive role when it comes to working with organizational data. So uh, I think this was a brilliant session, probably one of the most uh, finest ones that we have posted so far, because the point is that you picked up, I mean, it, it, it made everybody think pretty deep. In fact, uh, we actually started seeing how we can help must see India by building on those metric uh, hierarchies. So, uh, Ritma, we have a few questions for you before we drop off. I know uh, we are just about time. We have a good six minutes, if I'm not wrong. Yes, I have roughly six minutes now. I have a few list of questions that I'll be asking you. Uh, there'll be plenty of them. I see the chat window is getting crazy by now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult to read now. But I'll just try to pick up some vital questions which I feel uh, uh, could be pretty relevant for all of us. Now, uh, one question that somebody asked is, uh, uh, which which we actually did not dig deeper, is how did you use data to strategize your own career? So what what was your strategy from beginning as to what made you kind of 
walk into these different orgs and to get into these orgs how did you kind of build that strategy basis of data so how did you use data how did you use data science for your own career that's the, that's the yeah. question if i ask you yeah i uh, uh, i looked at the mission and the vision of the company whether i am excited about that and then i looked at really the growth rate right like when i look at companies i see hey and my data the kind of data points i look at is is the company growing like what's the number of employees has it grown year over year is the company's user base growing is the company solving a real problem are they really making an impact in the real world uh, is it changing people's lives on a day to day basis and really that's been the motivating factor for me to to change companies over a period of time so as you would see google was a company that was really changing like bringing bringing it in, important information at the click of a button and i could see people use it it changed my life it changed so many people's life it changed the industry it was growing tremendously and so i wanted to join google uh, same thing with flipkart like really when i joined flipkart so many years back um e-commerce was very new but i could see that it was growing i looked at the company insights i saw employee numbers were growing salaries were growing people were happy um so i looked at those data points and then i looked at usage the customers were growing um it was really changing the industry and the economy in india and so i wanted to be part of that story and so i joined flipkart uh with yahoo or oats the reason i joined that was similar that verizon took it over and there was just so much potential for it to change the world and it was hiring uh they were investing really a, a lot and then facebook as well wonderful and uh, over your transitions from these companies uh, did you see any massive change in the way the companies operate when you, when you talk about big companies like google and facebook do you see that this uh, this an entirely different culture altogether do they operate on entirely different lines or most of these big companies operate similarly i think it they all operate differently but the core tenets are the same right okay. i've seen uh, that they hire self motivated people they mm-hmm. hire smart people and they let you do the job they mm-hmm. uh, give you a big problem they throw you in the deep end and you're supposed to figure things out they are looking for people who are proactive right um they encourage people to ask questions they encourage it's generally a flat structure so really these core tenets are the same but based on the industry the size of the company the team that you're working in the people you're working on it kind of changes so the dna template of uh, the folks that you would want to work with it stays the same across all of these awesome companies right now this brings me to the next vital question which is uh, Uh, did you get involved in hiring data scientists i do yes yes okay so apart from these common traits what are the i lost you uh, ask me again okay, so is 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 it audible now yeah yeah okay so apart from these common traits that we have for pure people working in these awesome companies uh what else do you really focus on when you're hiring a good data scientist you know i am really looking at curiosity i'm seeing is the person curious is the person asking the right questions is the person um you know able to identify drawbacks of each metric that i'm throwing at him or her is the person able to figure better you know better solutions to a problem that already exists and is solved in the market is the person able to define the right problem to begin with um and is the person able is the person receptive to feedback uh so when i'm interviewing data scientists i'm able to like throw constraints and give you feedback and tell you to move on and are you receptive to that feedback able to collate, collate all of that together create a constructive answer in your mind and then articulate it really well for everyone to be able to understand okay so yeah i have quite a few of uh, really generic questions but uh, friends we may not be able to take up those questions something like what do you need to do to get into facebook and google that's too generic a question but however let's get kind of uh, uh, yeah, i do have another minutes time and i just want to ask one great question to ritima so ritima give me a moment i'll just search for one question that might kind of be a bouncer so let's see uh 
Can IT people, okay? A- anything that strikes you, Riddhima, something that is really awesome that you would want to kind of pick up? No, I mean, I just like to say that, look, it's super important to have the right metrics, define it correctly, measure it correctly. Uh, data science is really evolving in the way um, in the way it's it's uh, influencing product today. And really, um, data scientists, what they bring to the table is not just the education, the knowledge of data, but also the communication. So I would highly recommend everyone who wants to be a data scientist in one of these companies to not only understand data really well, but also understand how you articulate and communicate that data with different stakeholders, because really that is where the power lies of being able to communicate and articulate and influence strategy. Awesome. So friends, uh, wise word from Radhima here, and she's, she's probably kind of the right person to be in the, in the right spot to tell us all of these ideas because she herself has experienced this all across her career. She's worked for awesome companies. She's learned a lot from these companies, and that's, that's why Radhima, a big thank you on behalf of Insight. Uh, it's been an honor to get a post it in today's session, and we are really happy to kind of learn so much from you today. Yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity. It was fantastic. And I hope it was useful for everyone. Yeah, I'm pretty sure because uh, all the folks are sitting here, they all are aspiring data scientists and learning it from the person who manages teams that work with data scientists. I think that's, that's the best way they can possibly get to learn. So yeah, friends, it, it has been quite an eventful year and we are wrapping up 2020 in the C-Speaker sessions with Rudhima. She's, she's the last speaker for this particular year. And yes, I hope 2021 is going to be a little more better for all of us uh, and things will change drastically. So keeping that in mind, thanks a lot, Radhima, for your time and for sharing your knowledge here. And thank you all for attending today's session. We hope to see you again, Radhima, sometime down the line with some more insights around data science and product management taken together. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. Yeah, again, thank yeah, you. I think my friends here have also started thanking you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, so uh, anyway, thank so thanks a lot, Tia. Yeah. Sorry, over to you. Right. Thank you, everyone. Okay, yeah, thank you. So thank you, guys. You may all terminate the sessions now. Please log in back to your classes. So we just overshot by a minute or two. Please get back to your classes and we'll resume our courses uh, after the session. So uh, thank you all for attending. We may all terminate our sessions now. Thank you. Thank you, Ridma. Take care.